Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining me for the very first blast from the past. Uh, I'll introduce my guest in just a minute. I did want to uh, hopefully lots of you can join me. This is live on Facebook and on YouTube and is being recorded. I have a couple of announcements before I bring our, our guest in. First off, if you have a family photo album and you'd like to know more about it, it's my absolute favorite photo mystery to work on. Uh, and so I am running a class in February. I'm going to share the link. Um, so you have it. Let me get that to you. Here you go. Here's the link for the class. The other thing that's going on is uh, there are six women genealogy companies uh, banded together to do an enormous genealogy free giveaway. If you have not signed up for this, you should. It's got a couple of thousand dollars in gifts that we're giving away, a consult with me, uh, it, registration and Diane Southern's genealogy uh, DNA class, a family chart from Family Chart Masters, premium membership from Lisa Louise, some consultations from Legacy Family tree and from Amy Johnson Crow. This is definitely something you want to get in on. I'm going to share that link as well. It's our Valentine Day special and pretty easy to sign up. You have until February 11th to do that. And then uh, we are all going to go live on the 14th for Valentine's Day. So we'll see you then. Uh, in the meantime, let me bring my guest on. Here we go. Okay. My guest, that's good. My guest today is Lewis Takis. I'm not sure if you've listened to him or not, but he was on episode 153 of the Photo Detective podcast. Uh, Lewis is a brilliant photo researcher. He has been working on Ellis Island photos, photos by Augusta Sherman and by Lewis Hine. Uh, what else? Oh, he's coming to us from the Netherlands, which is why it's dark where he is and bright sunshine where I am. So wherever you are, I hope that you enjoy this Blast from the Past, which is a new series that we're offering once a month to uh, touch base with some uh, former podcast guests and find out where some of their projects stand and what they're working on now. So uh, next month, I'm still working on that guest. But for right now, we have Louis Takis. Louis, hi, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, and, and thank you. It's great to be here again. Yeah, and so, Louis, uh, you were on episode 153 talking about your project, which is called Let Me Get There, which is about immigrant photos. And I, I just love what you do with this and how you spied a tiny little clue in these pictures and then found all this information. And I believe there's a few photographs you want to talk about today, but do you want to give everyone sort of a brief overview if they don't know who you are and what you're working on? Sure, sure. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I am, I think, maybe for the last couple of years, uh, an amateur photo um, investigator. I uh, think so, Louis. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, uh, it was by accident, I think, that I got into it, but... but um, one thing led to another and then uh, another and another. And uh, here I am with a, a lot of research and work. Um, some of it just details, but some of it I think reaches deep into what immigration history is and what our visual record of particularly turn of the century or early 20th century um, immigrant uh, photographs have done for our uh, you know, collective visual uh, identity with 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 issues. That's a bit, yeah. That's broad, but um, uh, you have a couple of photos. You have three yeah, photographs yeah. that you want to talk about today. So, right. Uh, right. Why don't you send me one of them, and I'll put it up on the screen, I and that. I will also share a link to his blog post about that image. Which one are we going to start with, Lewis? We are going to start with a Greek woman named Teano Papasatirayu. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. So here's the blog post for everyone. That. 
Let's see. And then here's the image. Right. Right. Okay. So uh, this is a, a photograph shot in June 1909, just outside of one of the offices at Ellis Island. Um, and what it is about this photograph that I wanted to say now and what's maybe a bit new, I've got a long story that tells how I identified her, how I got into contact with uh, some family descendants, um, but also where she came from, why she was detained, um, or how she was detained, I should say. Uh, but also the, the photo itself, if you look closely um, on her left side, there is an immigrant identification tag, which had some details that I was able to use to zero in on her identity. As I started, I only had a name. The title of the photo was Greek woman, June 1909. Using some genealogical websites, I plugged in what I knew, which was just that. Uh, details from the photo, she has a small scar beneath her left eye that was um, useful in some of the other um, data that I found when I was trying to match the identity. But she's holding a, she, oh, by the way, she's wearing her bridal dress and it appears she wore this during the voyage to America. From She came from the island of Salamica in the Attica region of Greece, um, had the two week voyage. She was with four children. Um, but she's wearing her bridal dress with an elaborate uh, coral and um, gold and other uh, precious gems, you know, um, embroidered onto the dress itself. Uh, she's holding a shawl, though. And what's what's happened in the last few months is that I, through a family descendant, I got in touch with someone that I told the story about. Uh, she verified and said, oh, wow, I recognize that shawl. She searched uh, her own photo archive and found that she had a, a photo from the 1940s of her great-grandmother attending the wedding of a daughter, and she was wearing the shawl. So it really connected um, the image, more than 110 years old, with another image, about 60 years old, with today. Um, and well, that helped verify the story, of course, but it was just a, a remarkable journey from from all the details there, the, the elaborate dress uh, and um, what you can see, what's visible, and what people um, held on to. And that's the that's kind of what I wanted to talk about in the other pictures as well. So as interesting. So the family still owns the scarf, right? No, I can't. That I haven't Ooh. verified it. So they have a photo from 1947 uh, with the scarf that the grand, great grandmother was wearing, but of course it's a it's a fragile hand embroidered garment. Uh, um, yeah, I, I don't think it may still exist. They're looking for it, but at Cross least they fingers. recognized it. And that was really significant and, and yeah. special. And it's interesting that she's wearing her bridal dress. Yes. Because she doesn't look like a young woman. No, she's older than she looks, though. According to the records, she was about 40, maybe a le little less than 40. Mm. Um, mother of seven in total. Uh, her husband was a steamship captain. And um, yeah, she came on her own, well, with her with her four children to um, meet up with her family in California. So but when you contacted the family, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. did they know about this photograph? No, they didn't. They didn't. And I wasn't sure either until I put so much evidence together that it seemed like it couldn't be. In the article I have in, uh, in, the, in the piece I wrote, I reference a newspaper article that was made at the time that Teano landed. And it was, um, it was kind of a you know a exaggerated piece about a, a woman wearing eight thousand dollars worth of jewels yeah. arrives at Ellis Island and everyone was astonished and and all that, but no, it seems like she wore it uh, below deck at least for the tail end of the voyage. So mm. it's remarkable, remarkable. Yeah, it is remarkable. So what's yeah. the next 
image you have for us. Yeah, let me. And then, by the way, if anyone has any questions, you can ask them in obviously the chat for uh, Facebook or YouTube. I see all the the questions that you or comments that you post. Okay, I've got one more. Right. Uh, this is okay, and I'm going to share the blog post for this one. Right. So what we're looking at is a photo from July 1904. It's the earliest dated photograph by, definitively dated photograph by Augustus Sherman. Um, there was um, literally no information about the details uh, when I went went to um, try and figure out who these people were, except that they were a Russian family. Um, and that's about all it said. Hey, Lewis. <laughs> someone just wrote in the chat, my family. Okay, that must be some of the people I contact that, that I got in touch with. Yeah, yeah it, uh, it was just uh, delightful to hear that, um, like with the, with the Greek story, that there was another family out there. In this case, um, I mean, that knew the, that uh, recognized their family. Uh, Two but people. in this case, they knew the picture. They had seen it before because it was published twice in, in National Geographic in 1907 and 1917 reprinted. Again, with the same sort of nondescriptive, you know, caption, Russian family. Um, so how I did you figure out who they were just from yeah. that caption? Because I'm not seeing that tag in this picture. There's no tag. There's no tag. But there's a lot there that clued me in. The number of people, the fact that there's a newborn. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of the people I contacted that I, that I got in touch with, it's her. It, it was his mother that's sitting on the lap of of the mother in the photo. The young, the youngest girl is someone uh, is the mother of someone I got in contact with. Um, there was no tag, but the age difference. The man on the left, the old man, was the father. But he seems to have a young family. So I knew that that was something that might show up in some of the, the data points. Mm -hmm. uh, he seemed to be, when I was just guessing, he seemed maybe he's 20 years older than, than the wife. Um, but because there were so many children uh, also, I knew I could look for that many children with a father that seemed mm -hmm. to be, you know, such an age. Um, and then I assumed that they were Russian. And one other piece in the National Geographic article said, I think that they were a Russian Jewish family. So a few more bits of data. Uh, also though, and this you can't see unless you look really closely, but the old man, the, the father in the photo, um, his left eye seemed to be slightly not quite it, a little um, distorted, and that wasn't a, a defect in the photo. It seemed that he had some kind of a eye condition. So I was looking for someone with the other things I mentioned, along with someone that may, if, if the records show, and they usually do, particularly for older people in Ellis Island, um, things that might cause people to... Uh, to get held back, you know, to 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 face deportation, to go before a sport board of special inquiry, and maybe be deported. This was definitely the case with any kind of eye um, infections mm -hmm. or trachoma. Um, so that's what I used. I plugged it into some uh, yep. uh, ancestry. Uh, I'm sorry, genealogical websites, and um, I came up with some things. Uh, but the other thing um, about this picture, um, yeah, it just flew out of my head for a second. We're, well, but, we're having a mini family reunion over here in the chat. Okay, okay. So we have a man who said, my family, then he clarifies that and he says, my great, great grandmother, Minnie. Yeah. And right. then uh, this woman, Alicia, says, my great, great grandmother. And so uh, he's asking her 
which person in the photograph is her relative versus his. So we're having a mini family reunion, <laughs> which great. I just love. <laughs> yes. This is just so great. Yeah. The world is a very small place. It is. But now I remember the last thing uh, about the photo was that there was another photo taken of the family that I discovered in a newspaper article from September of 1904. Um, the same family outside, though, Ellis Island, in standing in the same order, wearing the same clothes. Um, that at least told me, OK, I can probably do this with the information I have because I had a date. Now I had a date of like September 1904. I knew that the date couldn't be any um, older than that. So I plugged it through uh, the databases and it took a while, but uh, not too long. I think a couple hours, probably a couple of hours of um, crisscrossing things. I came up with the likely uh, suspect and I still had to do some digging, of course, but that that's what led me to it. Um, Amazing. But there's something still in the family that they brought with them from Ellis yeah. Island. Yeah. And it's it's in the article itself. There's a photo of it. I think it'd be probably best if I don't confuse things and um, try to share that one. But the, uh, the, the father in the photo was a metalsmith by trade. And he brought three brass candle holders that were used for um, uh, Sabbath, for prayers. Uh, they seemed quite large from the photo I, I saw. Um, but he, he brought them with him. They're not in the photo, but they, uh, they're still around. More That's than amazing. 120 years, almost 120 years later, family members still have them. And it's a, it's incredible story. Uh, like I said, it's the earliest dated photo by Sherman. Um, but it's also, uh, it, it made my head spin a little bit because of, um, what I thought about early, uh, Jewish immigration to the U.S. Uh, at the time uh, didn't quite prove to be true. There was definite discrimination and uh, racism going on. But in this case, for a little while, for a window of time, it seemed that Russian Jewish immigration or Jewish immigration in general was promoted by the United States government. And the Commissioner General of Immigration at the time was very positive uh, about Russian, or I'm sorry, but yeah, but Russian Jewish immigrants coming to the U.S. It didn't last. It didn't last. And what's also remarkable about this family is that they were literally fleeing a pro pogrom um, in what was then Bessarabia, today uh, Moldova. Um, they were from the city of Kishinev, which is Chistinau in Moldova today. And in Kishinev had one of the first uh, worst pogroms against um, its Jewish community. So the family were leaving for those reasons, and that's why everybody is there. Um, yeah, it's remarkable. So how many of the, the I mean, you reached out to a lot of descendants, mm -hmm. um, but you have one, two, three, four, five, six children in this photograph. Mm -hmm. How many of those descendants did you reach out to? Well, I think two. I think two. two people are, it gets tricky because there, there are so many people. They all married, they all had children. Um, uh, but through those people, they reached out to others. So it's it's known in the family for sure. And they, and like I said, they knew about the photo. Uh, years ago, um, someone had, had recognized it in, in the National Geographic article as someone in the photo I'm sorry, someone in the family wrote to National Geographic 25 or 30 years ago asking about the photo. Uh, and well, it stayed within the family, um, but now it's it's a little, yeah, a little wider than that. And yeah, a little wider than that. that it's, it's the first first dated photo by him, uh, by Sherman, is, is pretty remarkable too. Yeah. All right, so you have one more photograph to one share with more. us. And one more story, and I will put that in the uh, yep. chat as well, so people can check okay. that out. I am doing it now. Should be showing. Yeah, I'm just putting the links in. Yeah. Take some 
Uh, there we go. This one's a fantastic. I mean, they're all fantastic stories, Lewis. I mean, you you yeah. you can't consider yourself an amateur. You might have been an amateur well. when you first started, but you are certainly not an amateur now. Not with no. these images and the things that you've looked at and the way that you have um, coordinated all the little bits of information. And so let's talk about this one because you've got an update to this one. Yeah, definite update to this one. And yeah, maybe some of that attention to detail comes from the fact that I, I'm a librarian. Um, we're, we're a detail-oriented profession, so I, I wouldn't be any good if I didn't have that, I guess, under my belt. Um, but yeah, so this photo, the classic Ellis Island photograph, Italian family looking for lost baggage. It's been reproduced countless times, I think, everyone in your audience in the audience out there should have seen it um uh and yeah well okay so it, i i tell the story out, how it's this, called the lost luggage yes yeah the lost luggage the the name of the the photograph is italian family searching for lost luggage another caption by hein says something like worried expressions on their faces are the result of luggage being lost. Uh, well, what I did with this photo, I don't know if you can see it, but if you look at the, the website image, you'll see that the baggage at the, at the foot of the mother uh, has a name scrawled on it. And it's not visible unless you really have a good, good quality picture and zoom in close and try a lot of different letter combinations. But the name is Anna Shiachikano, Shiakitano, Shiakitano. And uh, that piece of information is what I used together with the composition, um, the information from Hein, the relative date that he gave, which was anywhere between 1905 and 1909. Uh, that's what I used to, to get to the identity. I tell the story on the site. I think I went into this before. Um, in this case, the family knew about the picture, like like the story of the, the, the Russian Jewish family from Bessarabia. This family knew the story, but it seems to have dropped off the radar screen for a lot of people. Um, I eventually got into touch with people uh, from descendants and relatives of the people in the picture. And um, through through what I wrote, I filled in a lot of different information about their journey, why this family was was there. Um, if there was anybody else in the family that wasn't photographed, it turns out there was, and what became of them. Um, but the update is that from the title of the photo, Italian Family Searching for Lost Baggage, it looks like the family kept that piece of lost baggage. It's not visible in the photograph, but after getting in touch with um, a descendant of the family, um, yeah, we, 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 it took a while, um, but eventually they got it. They, they, they pulled it out of um, their basement. <laughs> They've kept it for more than 110 years. And it's incredible. It's just incredible. It's an it's a it's an enormous wooden box, but that's the piece that they were looking for. The real thing, the real story, though, is why did it get lost, and what what's the story behind that? Well, that's in the piece online. It, it will take too long to explain. It's a long, but, it's a um, long story. Yeah, but uh, I do have photos of that piece of lost luggage, and it also has the initials A S C for Anna. Giacitano, the maiden name of the of the mother, uh, hammered onto the top of the box itself. So these things endure, and in all cases, um, like the shawl, which at least one family has a photograph of uh, in the Greek woman photograph picture, um, or the the candle holders from the Bessarabian Jewish family. Um, or the trunk, a piece of, piece of missing luggage. It's incredible. But while I was doing that also, I also discovered that Hein, there was another photo that Hein took at Ellis Island in the same, the same time that he took this picture. 
another picture he has called English family, um, which had been identified by family mem descendants um, and positively dated. It turns out it's the same date that this family arrived at in 1908. Uh, so Hein, now we know at least exactly what he was doing on one day in <laughs> May 1908, which was, was taking two iconic pictures. But it, 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 uh, it just, th this yeah. is new information. As far as I know, nobody's written about the connection between the two photos and certainly not the lost luggage. So. All right, well, I'm going to take it off the screen because we have some oh, questions, yeah. I think. Okay. Uh, Lewis, thank you very much. We have a question. Well, we've had this mini family reunion over here where someone says Bertha Koch and another guy says family grind. Um, green, I'm not sure what, how those all connect, but they appear to all connect to that okay. one photograph with the six pe children. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Lynn asks, were all people photographed at Ellis Island? No, they no. weren't. They weren't. But I, I write about this in, in my piece. Uh, there was a lot more photography going on than you might expect. It's just that besides Sherman, um, the, the categories that uh, were made for the photographs that were taken might surprise you. In 1904, right around the time when Sherman first started taking his pictures at Ellis Island, um, the Commissioner General of Immigration, Frank Sargent in Washington, D.C., requested that all convicts, prostitutes, and anarchists be photographed, starting in 1905. Uh, it, it, yeah, January 1905. It went on until 1909. NARA in Washington, D.C. has hundreds of these photographs of convicts, prostitutes, and anarchists. The thing is, about those pictures is that they they were they were taken at different immigration stations but the sets that came from Ellis Island have an unbelievable uh, similarity to Sh Sherman's work both in the composition the framing the objects in the, in the in the in the photos um, the props in the background the positioning the angles the lighting and a few other things uh, what I'm working on now is finding, figuring out for sure if um, it could be that Sherman took those pictures as well. If that's mm -hmm. the case, there's a couple hundred more photos by Sherman. If it wasn't him, it was someone taking pictures exactly like him at the same time, at the same place. So that's really amazing. But that's no, amazing. Not, every, not everyone had their picture taken, but if you were deported... <laughs> There was a good chance that you did. Or you were a convict. Said, or you were a convict. And it's, yeah, I'm smiling now when I say it, but it's really, uh, you know, some heartbreaking stories that are beneath it all. Uh, I go into some of it in my piece, and I'll get into that more later once I get more data back from Nara. So does anyone have any questions for Lewis? Um, Arthur wrote that, you gave him great insight of your of his great grandmother's family, and he thanks you for that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, Arthur was the person I connected with with the, yeah. the Cohen family with the Bessarabian. Yeah, he shared a couple. He shared a photo with me of um, two people in the photo. That's also um, online. Yeah, uh, th their names were um, Minnie. Their nicknames were Minnie and Tiny. <laughs> Minnie and Tiny, and they owned a candy shop in uh, Connecticut. Is one there of their go. early jobs. It's incredible. Any other questions for Lewis? Going once, I would like to ask you all if you would like to hear more about what uh, Lewis has been working on and how he got started. Uh, he is in uh, episode 153 of The Photo Detective, available in all major podcast outlets, also available on my website. Uh, G, uh, two more questions for you at the last minute, and then we're going to wrap up. Okay. Uh, Alicia asks, do you think that Thano was photographed due to her wearing her wedding dress or because she was being detained? Both. Uh, she was detained for five days. I can't determine the reason for it, but it might intersect with that category that I just mentioned before. She wasn't any of those things, but there was some suspicion, I think, because of 
uh, unbelievable discrimination that was taking place against um, Romani or gypsies mm. um, who were categorically almost to the letter excluded. They dressed somewhat uh, ostentatiously. And I think that she was mistaken for being a Romani and put under more scrutiny because of that, because the, mm. the inspectors there didn't know the difference. And there was such an anti romani uh, discrimination going on at Ellis Island that uh, they deported hundreds of, of Romanis in, even by that time, by 1909, um, that she was mistaken for that. And that is the reason. Now, I think they at some point determined that she wasn't, uh that she was perfectly not that that was a category that should get you deported but they determined that she didn't fall in that category and that i wonder if it's in. just because of the number of jewels that she was wearing and gold that, that called attention true. to her because most people yeah. coming through ellis island were not well off and, and i think there was not. a limit to the amount of money you could bring in I haven't seen that. Not no, a limit to I the money. There was a certainly, limit. there was a minimum amount at some. Oh, point. a minimum, you a minimum. That's what I remember. Come in without a certain amount, and you had to have connections, and yeah, of course. Mm. Jean asks, "Who would possibly admit they were a prostitute? Was that just an assumption made by those in charge?" It's just, absolutely. Yeah. It was an assumption, and it was um, the same category for uh, convicts. Um, I go into this in, in the last chapter on Sherman. How did you figure out whether someone was a convict or an anarchist or a prostitute or a polygamist? Well, according to a newspaper article from the time, an inspector says, if someone is suspected of looking a certain way, like he might have spent time in prison, <laughs> little here's, rough the, here are the questions that you should ask. And yeah. they, they trick the person up basically um, by looking at looking like they have information that they don't that's all i have to go on i don't i don't think there's anything in the the rule book for inspectors that went into this um there could be but i haven't seen it yet uh but yeah it, it, for a prostitute I, I don't know um i think well if you were an unmarried if you were um an unmarried woman with a child that was a, a signal. Mm. Uh, if you were pregnant and you were not going to join your husband or your husband wasn't um, in the party you were with, that was a trigger as a well. A red flag. Yeah. yeah. We have a couple of other comments. Okay. Uh, Sherry says that her grandma was detained due to her poor eyesight and they had a box mm. of glasses left behind and they gave her a pair. Uh, and then Lynn says that her great grandfather was detained in 1922 in the hospital. Would there be records to find behind the ship besides the ship records? I don't know. Yeah, possibly. Uh, you should look at the if if she was either she'll show up in possibly three places on the ship's manifest besides the uh, you know the diagnostic data, her entry and who she was going to, how much money she had. If she was detained, there's another sheet that has some more information. It's usually at the end of the rolls of the manifest. If she was held before a board of special inquiry, uh, then there might be some more information and there might be a number if she was slated to be deported and then appealed and won her appeal there's a very good chance that Nara has that appeal transcript. That was the case for the um, Cohen family. Uh, there's a set of transcripts. You'd, you'd have to look at the, the manifest role to see that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jenna comments that information, I think this is referring to whether or not you're a convict or a prostitute. Yeah. Um, that information would have been provided on the departure, wouldn't it? Not the individual necessarily disclosing. Well, I suspected, I, I also wondered uh, how, how do you identify a person? Was it something in their passport? Uh, was it uh, in some kind of travel document they had that noted something about their, their, whether they had spent time in prison for 
crimes against moral turpitude is what it was called. Mm. But in reality, those crimes turned out to be stealing wood. Because you needed it. <laughs> stealing right. peas. I'm, I'm not joking. I, I, yeah, I, no. I talk about this too. It's just absurd. But it's it's. I, don't, I haven't seen any evidence that it showed up in any travel documents or in a passport, for instance, that you were an ex-convict. If you were, uh, that you shouldn't have been able to embark um, in whatever uh, country that you were coming from. Yeah. All right. 99% of all the convicts that I've seen, at least in the indexed records, well, maybe not 99%, but let's say 90% were Italian. There was a heavy discrimination, as, as you all know, about, yeah. <laughs> against those people, too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us for Blast from the Past, the very first one. When I ran a survey at the beginning of the year, many people said they wanted the video calls back. So we're giving it a trial. Uh, my first guest was Louis Takis with the Let Me Get There project. Uh, I have a full year of uh, Blast from the Past, the last week of every month. Uh, join me here on Facebook and YouTube. Lewis, thank you so much um, for My doing pleasure. this. I always enjoy talking with you, and I love hearing uh, you know, all the new things that you come up with and all the ways that this connects to both things that people keep and family history and history in general. It's great. We have one last question as usual. Okay. Um, Mary asks, is there a code that shows why they were detained on the ship? Uh, yes. yes. If they were, if they were detained, there should be a mark on the first part of the manifest. Look at the end of the, uh, the run of the manifest to see if they show up there. And then there's more information about, um, yeah, potentially more information about the cause for detention and all that. Most of the causes were likely to become a public charge. That was the case yeah. for the uh, Cohen family. Don't they, forget. One thing about the Cohen family too, it's amazing, is that they, it was an enormous ship. Over almost half of the people, um, more than a thousand people were detained. Uh, hundreds of people held before special inquiry two or three that were scheduled to be deported. It's remarkable. Uh, and only one family that won their appeal, and that was the Cohen family. Mm. So they were the only ones that, um, yeah, it's remarkable. <laughs> so if you want to follow Lewis's yep. blog, uh, I gave some links. Uh, I also want to remind you, if you have not signed up for the Valentine's Day, big giveaway. I'll put the, I'll put the link back in there one more time. Uh, but this would be uh, a wrap for the very first blast from the past. Um, I look forward to next month and next month's guest uh, who will be announced shortly. <laughs> so watch this space. Thank you so much, Lewis, please take Thank care. You, uh, I can't wait. Maybe we'll have you on again when you have some more. And I know that we have, we are not going to stop hearing about you. Okay. Um, this project has legs for sure. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll take that. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.